disappointed faces this morning when they saw me up here, but I told you that I was coming back. I warned you that I was going to be back. You didn't pay attention. Oh, you weren't listening? Okay. Well, I use that as excuse. Would you bow with me now as we begin our class? Father, we come before you this morning. We're mindful of so many people that are from this congregation or have friends that are not feeling well. They have lots of problems, some of them very severe. We pray that you'll be with each of those that have asked for prayers. We know that there's comfort that comes only from you. We ask you to be with us as we try to lighten their load and do what we can to make it easier for them. We ask you to be with us now as we begin to study your word. Help us in that study. It's through Jesus that we pray. Amen. You know, our prayer list is quite lengthy. Uh, there are 12 names on there. And I don't, it's been a long time since I've seen that many names on that list. And some of them are quite serious. Okay, we are in uh, John, 1 John. We're ready to begin chapter 3. Chapter 3 starts off talking about love. John uses the word love 46 times. Now, I didn't count those. I took somebody else's word for it, so you can count them. But in this short little book, he uses the word love 46 times. And all of the commentaries that I read looked at this as a total change of, of thought. In other words, there was no going back and trying to make a uh, connection between the things that had gone on prior in this letter to love. And I want to do that, and you may disagree with me a little bit this morning, because I want to take this uh, thought and look at the conflict that was going on that was really the subject of this letter. There were people, John called them Antichrist, and if we look at a lot of the things that these people were teaching, they were saying that Christ is, is not a real person. And in verse 26 of chapter 2, John says, These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. Now, obviously, there was a major conflict going on, and these people that were involved received this letter. It was written to them. If we look at love in the context of the conflict itself, one thing that's not there is that John doesn't say, let's all just love each other and get along. He makes a specific point of saying, these people are not of us anymore. They weren't, were, but they're not of us any longer and don't let them try to deceive you. What I want to think about this morning a little bit is, do we think that letter would have had any impact on the recipients? I suspect it might have. I'll share with you a real life example of a congregation in conflict. It doesn't really matter what it was over, but it got nasty, it got personal. There were things said in anger that would have never been said without some outside influence. 
got almost physical. It got to the point that there was just no way to resolve it between the parties. One party, one group simply left, started their own. Feelings probably cooled a little bit. Some of those people decided they had made a mistake for whatever reason. They come back. That situation is one that love is all important to making it work. Because the words that were spoken are not taken away, they're still there. Every conversation, every Bible class, every sermon had the potential of bringing the conflict back out. Maybe not even in context, but one party or the other could take it wrong. Now, I don't know if certainly can't get in John's mind and know that's what he's talking about here, but I think it fits. Love has a major impact on the healing process. It's the only way it can work. And in this case, it didn't work. Feelings were just too raw, too much emotion. Okay. Questions, comments? First John chapter three. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know him. The world does not know us, it doesn't know the children, it doesn't know the Father. But what a concept that Christians have to be called children of God. I want to look at another context where that's used. Galatians chapter 4. Beginning in verse 1. Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, does not differ at all from a slave. That a child does not differ at all from a slave, though he is master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the Father. Even so, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. We might receive the adoption as sons. We started off in saying that the son, the children, are the same as a slave. Do we ever mature to the point that we are not the slave? That we are not considered a child? I want you to think about that. We're going to come back to that later on in, uh, in this uh, letter concept of maturity. Do we as Christians ever get to the point that we have certainty in our lives? That 
we have certainty of our future as a Christian. We're servants of God in Christ. We are servants. We are always. Okay. Here comes our microphone. <laughs> she said, she said, we are servants of God through Christ and Christ. And, Christ. And, and that's true. We always are that. We never go beyond that. Okay, we got, we got another one back here. Ralph. We, uh, we never get beyond that, that servant classification. Okay, Ralph. You know, when you think of a person being a child, it's always in, in perspective. Uh, before God, I believe we're all children because of his aspect and ours. You know, even our own children, uh, those who are born of our body, they are always our children. Even when they're adults, my kids are my kids, my children. I love them. So in that aspect, it's your aspect where you are at that time and who you're with. With your peers, those you've grown up with, uh, you could you could be a number of things. You could be childlike in your actions. You could be uh, uh, have a lot of wisdom. It depends on that person's actions and how he how he uh, poses himself and what he does with his life. Uh, there are some people who grow up and never do. I work with some of them guys, those guys. Uh, and yet there are some who always maintain decorum and the way they handle themselves. So it's also how we handle ourselves before Christ. We are his servants. We are God's children. But we also were told to quit ourselves like men and to gird our loins and do what needs to be done. Those are also things that are part of of each individual person and how they behave and how they act. Okay, I will, uh, one of the things that Ralph mentioned is one that I uh, thought about quite a bit and that is that our children will always be our children. But you know, there comes a time and uh, not all of us, but most of us, where as children, we then become responsible for those parents. We take over much of the role that they had as parents. We become pretty much the decision maker, the caretaker, the caregiver. Okay, one more. Let's, let's do this, let's alternate sides. Over here. Well, in, in the verse, it says slaves. And then later in verse uh, 7, it says we're no more a servant. So we are supposed to mature and develop and take, uh, grow out of that child position and slave position. Then it becomes a willing position of service. I think that's a, an extremely good point that it becomes a willing service so that the servant or the slave aspect is gone. We're doing it willingly with the same uh, results, if you will. This, this may have been, uh, and going back to the Galatians aspect, uh, might be a little bit difficult to, to rationalize one-on-one -on -one because if we go back to the context we go back to the verses that were before what we're reading here. It's talking about the law being the caretaker of the people until it comes full blown into Christ. So there's kind of a little bit of mixing metaphors that we're doing here, but Beth is right that uh, we do mature to the point that it's willing instead of an obligation or instead of uh, the slave point. <coughs> Okay? Beloved, now we are children of God, 
and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I want to look at that phrase, we shall see him as he is. What does that mean to you? I'll tell you that most of the, in fact, all of the commentaries that I looked at were taking off on the point that no man can see God. You know, even Moses was restricted to seeing God's back. He couldn't see him in the face. But there's a number of verses in there in the Bible, both old and new, that say man cannot see God. Man is prohibited from looking at God. That's where the commentaries took this, see him as he is. Does anyone else, am I the only one that that's one of the last things that I see here? What did they say? They say that, you, that we will be able to look upon God, physically look upon God. Okay, what does it mean spiritually? That we will see his likeness and his likeness will be in us. We'll see him spiritually and his likeness will be in us and we will see his greatness, but we won't actually be able to view him as a person because he isn't. Okay, but we will be like him. Spiritually. Yeah. Well, the first thing I, when I think about that, when I, seeing him as he is, seeing him as a creator, seeing him as a creator, aren't there things that you wonder about? And one of the first things that, that I think about is how can he put the power in something that we can't see? that's so tiny like an atom and yet when we separate that into its pieces it creates such a tremendous explosion how can he pack all that power in there one of the most awesome things about seeing God as he is would be to see him as a creator all-knowing all-powerful I must be the only person that thinks that way. Okay, Ralph again. I think it's very much possible that we will see him as he is, especially in judgment. Uh, when those times come and that is revealed, I do believe we will see God as he is. Uh, whether you stand before Jesus or God the Father, you're going to be there. You're going to see them. You will see them as apparently the angels see him now. Uh, it's just the fact that it's not yet, it's not revealed yet, but then we haven't crossed the veil as yet. No. Well, that's, uh, you know, Nancy doesn't really believe that we will see him. I, I do. I agree with Ralph. I think we will see him. And we'll see him as he is. Now, I don't know what that is, but we'll be like him. But we'll be like him. Okay, a couple of verses that are scriptures that I wrote down. 2 Corinthians 3.18, we will be changed from glory to glory. Romans 8.29, we will conform to the image of the Son. Philippians 3.20, we'll conform to his image. So, you know, we will be changed. We don't know to what, but we will see him as he is. And everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself. Now that is the condition that we all have. 
if we have that hope in him, then we must purify ourselves. We must be righteous. We must live as Jesus lived. We must have that sense of purity and righteousness. That's our side of the covenant. If we do that, then we know that God will keep his side. Okay, verse 4. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Now, you know, just a quick reading of that seems to take us really down the wrong path because we know that we all sin. We know that even after we have decided to walk that Christian life, we still sin every day. So what John is talking about here must be habitual sin. We're making no effort. We know we're going to do it no matter how hard we try. Okay? Paul. Whoa, 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 wait just a minute. I can talk loud enough. One thing that we have that the world doesn't have in Christ, we have an advocate with the Father, a mediator. He's our propitiation, which means appeases God's wrath. So in that sense, when we do sin, if we repent properly, then we're forgiven. And, of course, the world is not. So that's the way I view that. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, we have that. And it, it goes back to that purity. We're never going to be pure, but we can strive for it. And as Paul says, we have that advocate for us. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is, right, is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of Man was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The devil has sinned from the beginning. What is the beginning? Pardon? Creation? That's one. One option, Second Peter 2, 4 would seem to indicate that uh, he was present. Are there any other options? I mean, to me, that's where his effect came on in the world, is when he started affecting mankind. And, of course, we know when that started. From the beginning at creation. I think most of us would agree that, you know, we don't know exactly when Satan was... word do I use? Satan came into being. He was one of the angels apparently. But we do know that sin came into the world at creation. Let 
What was the purpose of the Son of God? For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. The Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. What's the primary work of the devil? Pardon? Hebrews 2, 14. Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same, that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. You know, the last thing that Jesus destroyed was death. Death wasn't that what came into being in the, at creation? As a penalty for the sin that Satan induced Adam and Eve to partake of, their penalty was death. So Jesus came to destroy that power of death. He might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin because he has been born of God. Jack. Uh, that word cannot, it, uh, I referenced it back to where Jesus was uh, contending with the Jews. And he said, you cannot hear my words. In other words, they didn't want to. So that corresponds with that. You don't want to sin. You, uh, okay. Over here. Yeah. That's right. Well, you know, he uses the word practice there four different times. Uses the word what? Practice. Practice. Both in context of practicing sin and practicing righteousness. And when we practice something, it shows intent, desire to do it. And we need to be practicing righteousness, or otherwise we are going to be practicing sin. Yeah. Yeah. Another another word would again would be habitual. You know, if we're trying our best, then we're okay even though we're going to fall off occasionally. But I want to look at the, the word seed here. What remains in us? Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. What's the seed? I got you on this one because I got some notes. His seed remains in him. Could it be the Holy Spirit? Wow, silence. I hear a yep. We got a bunch over here on this one. That goes back to the parable of the sower. God's word uh, dwells within us, and that would be the seed. God's word be the seed. I agree with Jack. I think that's, a, a, I think, a fair representation of what it might be, because it, it's called the seed. 
But then you also have to think about in, in Genesis when uh, Abraham was told about the seed of righteousness. So there's always something that c it could be, but I, I do believe in this case it does refer to the word. Okay. I've got Gail down here. In three different places, um, we read where the Holy Spirit is the truth. We read where the, I'm sorry, word the Holy is Spirit is what? The truth. The truth. The Spirit is the truth. Okay. In First John five six, and then Thy Word is truth, which is John seventeen seventeen, and then Jesus is the truth. So I think somehow it's it's all connected, but it dwells in us. And like. A, Someone said about the, the word being the seed from uh, Luke 8, the parable of the sower. That's one application, but it could be any of the three. It could be. Okay. Uh, word of God, the word, Colossians 3, 16, 1 Peter 23, and James 1, 18. The word dwells within us. The Word has the power to beget, and Christians are brought forth from the Word. New life. And that's kind of all bound up into everything that we're saying here. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Romans 6, John 3, Romans 6. All talk about the new life. And then the Holy Spirit, Acts 2, 38, Corinthians 6, and Romans 8. I think the, okay. We, we argue about the, the work of the Holy Spirit, but obviously the Holy, and everybody, everybody concedes that, uh, uh, that it has to do with the Word. Uh, when people were baptized at Pentecost, he said, you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, which most people say is the Holy Spirit. Well, with the Holy Spirit comes the Word. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know how to put this, and, and language that wouldn't that's just not juvenile but basically this the spirit is the is the carrier the purveyor uh the instigator of the word and if we have the word we have the spirit we have the spirit we have the word it's they're they're interchangeable inseparable too inseparable okay anything else Oh, we have, yeah. Yeah, hang on just a minute. Well, the, well, the seed reminds me of everlasting good, like, or just good. The seed is being good. I'm sorry, I didn't. I said the, the seed represents for me is good. And then even, even almost if I want to take it another step, everlasting good. Okay. That is the, uh, probably the, the bottom line is that we have the good. Seed is good. The Word is good. The Holy Spirit's good. And necessary. Okay, we have one more in the back. To go along with what she just said, in 1 Peter one twenty three, it talks about uh, the incorruptible seed and the uh, corruptible seed, it talks about it being by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. So, same. Same? Yeah. We can go to a number of places and have each one of these thoughts, the Holy Spirit, the word, as being absolutely necessary. And a seed is necessary for propagation. If we're thinking especially about plants, you know. Life comes from seed. Okay, any, any more? Verse 10. 
In this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Now what? How are they made manifest? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Whoever does not, it's made manifest because we can see who does not practice righteousness, they're therefore not of God. Nor is he who does not love his brother. Now, we've talked about this before, and this is going to come up several times about love of brother. Obviously, it is very important because we cannot be of God if we do not love our brother. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one and murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. And we probably will never truly, completely, totally understand the fact that one brother's gift was good and the other was bad. Except that God wanted it one way and that's not the way he got it. But Cain was of the wicked one and murdered Abel. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. And that gets pretty serious. If we don't love our brother, we abide in death. And we can get into all kinds of conversations about who our brother is. Uh, we'll amplify that a little bit as we go, but you can be thinking about it. Who is your brother? Do we really know who our brother is? Okay. He says, I am a brother. Let's, we'll, we'll deal with that in just a minute, okay? Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And I think one other thing that we sometimes tend to do is we put the emphasis on the word hate. Okay? You know, we don't hate anybody. But is there a middle ground between love and hate? Yeah. There really isn't. There really is no middle ground between love and hate. So we're going to see here what it means to love our brother. And if we don't do that, then we're the other extreme. We're a murderer. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Verse 16, by this we know love because he laid down his life for us. Okay. We know in John 13 that Jesus laid down what he called the new commandment. No longer are we to love our neighbor as ourselves, but we are to love each other as Jesus loved us and he was willing to lay down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Do we? 
What's in mind? What's in view here? Is it a physical death? Is that what necessarily we're talking about here? In the extreme, it could be, absolutely. But in the normal, it's not. But we do lay down our lives if we're searching for that purity and that righteousness that he's been talking about. It's a change. It's to do away from the old and start the new. Verse 17 gets really down to the heart of it. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? Now this is getting down to where it, we have to give up some of those things that are, quote, ours. It's personal. It's serious. If we don't take care of our brother, sees his brother in needs and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. And by this we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Now let's think a little bit about what Frederick said earlier about who our brother is. And I made the comment, do we really know who our brother is? Do we know each other well enough to know their heart? Or are we, are we judging each other based on word and deed? Think about that a little bit. By their fruits you shall know them. Do we know each other that well? Okay. I, I think sometimes we have the heart of Jonah. We want people to repent, but we still, we can see that they may have been wasteful and things, and we kind of want to see them get a little um, punishment as well. Our hearts aren't in their best interest. Our hearts are in just desserts a lot of times. And our I hearts are what? I'm sorry. We're, we're, we want them to get their just desserts. If oh. they have been um, the 11th hour uh, repenter and things, sometimes we, we don't want them to get quite what we think we deserve. That's um, Jealousy? Jealousy, a really hard thing. A really hard thing for Christians who've tried to do right all of their lives, and it's the case with the elder brother and the case of Jonah and things. Sometimes we just we don't have that love for the brother who hasn't woken up quite as early. I think that's very true. Anything else? Anyone? Anyone? You know, we just I think we need to be really really careful about trying to define our brother very narrowly. You know, Jesus died for the sinners. But in this context, the writer describes who the brothers are. That's right. But he also says that it's of the heart. And we can't always judge the heart. 
we can, let's see if I can put it a different way. We can know a lot of people are not brothers. We cannot always know who our brothers are. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. Sheeps and wolves clothing? Yeah. Okay. Got Ralph back here. I think that's the parable of the Good Samaritan, illustrate our brother. I think that's true. Okay. Hey, back over here. Um, I was taught <clears throat> that <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I was taught that everything, whether healthy or not, and anything is supposed to be considered a brother. Um, that was like installed to me when I was really young that everything, whether it's healthy or unhealthy, now there's distances I can take that are healthy from from uh, more negative things, but that everything is supposed to be looked at as a brother. I think we're all coming around to that. I think that, you know, Jesus died for everybody. And if we would have patterned our lives after him, you know, uh, I'm a brother. But not necessarily in the... Yeah, okay. It says in Mark uh, that who does God's will is my brother. Who does God's will is my brother. And we can tell who our brothers are by whether or not they do the will of God. Okay. But I still come back to the not of word or deed, but of the heart. Okay, one more back here. My understanding was always that we love our brother as ourselves, which is all people, men, women, even the non-Christians, the because you can hate their actions, but you should love them, pray for them, pray for their worthiness, pray for their sins, but love them as you love yourself. You want to be forgiven, and you want the love of everyone. So we should love each other, everyone, as ourselves, but hate their sin, hate their action. Again, you know, I'll say that Jesus died for all. It's up to us to take advantage of it. And if, if we're to pattern ourselves after him, then the world is our brother. Is everybody confused? Okay, one over here. Here's Helen. Okay, let's. We're brothers and sisters. Then the other people, oh, I'm sorry, once we're baptized into Christ and adopted, we're his adopted children, then we're brothers and sisters. But then the, uh, the world is still out there. We're to love them, but they're not our brothers yet. I, I didn't look at them as being our brother. This is why we call each other sister and brother. Am I confused well, about you know, that? We're, we're, we're talking about two different things, okay? We have brothers and sisters in Christ. No question about it. The question is, who do we treat as a brother in this context? If we see a brother in need, well, let's, let's finish that next week. I got two or three verses that we need to look at to, Try to. <laughs> All right.